Hello, everybody. I'm happy that we are here and a session here in Switzerland. I see there are people from all over the world joining. I'm very happy that so many people are interested in the session. And um, yes, it is a pleasure to host it here in uh, Switzerland. We wanted to meet in person as the restrictions got better in Switzerland, but still it is not free enough to meet. So we are in completely different uh, spots spread over Switzerland. So in the eastern part, in Zurich, in Basel, in Geneva. So we are multi um, locations here. Um, I welcome you very much to this session on um, green spaces and densification. You can imagine that this is a very urgent topic in a small country like um, Switzerland. So we have the Alps, we have urban regions, and the densification is one of the most um, thrilling issues we have. So most of the decisions that are taken tend to one that the spaces are even more urbanized, that green spaces um, can stay where they are or can be developed is a huge issue. That's why we came together um, as a group of um, interested people. So especially from the applied school of the Grishans with the um, colleagues from Dresden Sommer, which is an architectural office. And we connected in, I think, in early winter. We just got to know each other and thought we have to work on this topic. We really want to tackle questions that um, are concerning the issues we ha are having here and, of course, are also um, very important for other regions in the world. So. To let you know who is here and are still people joining and people coming in, um, to let you know who is here today, I'm doing the moderation with um, Haris Piplas. He is now in Zurich and working at uh, Dres in uh, summer since last year 2020. And um, before he was studying or he did his studies uh, in Berlin in the Technical University in um, urban design. He has a master in urban design. And then he did his PhD at the ETH in Zurich in uh, the Institute of Urban um, Landscape Studies. He has worked on several projects that um, consider the urban landscape and um, smart innovation strategies, for example, for Jakarta or green urban reactivation for Sarajevo. And what I found very interesting, Haris, to learn from you is that you are co-author of the publication Global Urban Toolbox. So I think you compare in case studies um, different cities with each other. And yeah, maybe you can also bring some of your thoughts and your work into this discussion today. But we are co-moderating. So I give over to you that you can also um, touch a bit of, on the topic that we are discussing today. Sure, it's a great pleasure to um, see people from around the world in the session, as you mentioned, Bianca. And thank you and Sandra and to my colleagues, uh, Christiane and Michael for working on the preparation of this session. It was a great collaboration, again, between, I feel, the civil society, the industry and the universities. So I think we have the right setup here. And of course, uh, it's a great pleasure to have also Dr. Hejazi from the University of Geneva. Um, we are very glad to hear more of the use cases from your side, and we're going to introduce our speakers more in detail in a, in a few moments. But uh, now I also use this opportunity to, um, to introduce you to the people who don't know you here, Bianca. I think you are a very well-known figure in the FUF network. And um, I was also very glad to hear about your career development, about your uh, doctorate in social science and sustainability research in the University of Basel, and now how you moved in to, to found the uh, Urban Green Polylog as a platform, right? And do you manage also the Arbor City Net in Switzerland? So uh, a very engaged person and an, an active advocate in this uh, sort of field where we try to 
to prove that there's no conflict between the green and the social in our cities. And uh, um, when I was also, um, uh, after we met, I, I realized that you also have been publishing very interesting uh, um, works on sustainability and, and resilience in social ecologic systems. So I think this, uh, this background somehow flew into this uh, concept of this session as well. And I feel also with our speakers, we're gonna be able to, to share with you some insights on, uh, on, on urban resilience and densification. What's the uh, concern with green and social spaces in cities? And for that, just before we start with our speakers, uh, prepared also based on our month long discussions uh, in, in this task force who organized that, I prepared also a couple of uh, images just to share with you as a, not as an ultimate response and an answer, but just as a, uh, as a food for discussion and food for the future, uh, um, the question and answer session that we're gonna have here. And um, again, good to see Cecil and Tatiana and many other friends and colleagues inside and very happy to hear from you later in the discussion. But just let me share some first thoughts about Before the you, while, while you start your presentation, I just wanted to tell that, or to, to ask the people um, if they could switch off the camera if they're not presenting and if they have any questions and mute um, the um, microphones that we can really listen to all the presentations in a proper sound. And if you have any questions to some of the presenters or if you have specific ideas, what you want to add, would you please write them in the chat and we will try to pick them up during the discussion, but also at the end. So I hope you use all the tools that are here. So Harris, it's your turn. Thank you. You, know, you completely right. It, this should be a dialogue here and not the uh, ex cathedra session. So very happy to, to hear from, from our audience. But just if you allow me for the next couple of minutes uh, is an intro a more rational why we think that green, discussing green spaces and urban densification is important also in, in the context where we sit today in Switzerland. And if I just fly over some images that most of us know and, and uh, if we talk about green space and densification in, in the cities, not only in Europe, but in the global south, these um, hypothesis or actually the reality that cities, um, we know it that they consume the majority of our energy, they are responsible for the uh, uh, vast amount of greenhouse gas emissions, but, and then they host the 50% of the people of the planet, right? So we live in an urban planet, but they take only 2% or 3% depends on the, on the, on the sources of their, um, of the, let's say the whole earth surface. And in this sense, um, this is becoming even more important now in these times of the pandemics and um, without um, banalizing all the victims that we had to uh, to to offer or had to actually to uh, the victims to, to the world that pandemics spurred cities to make green spaces for more people in the past. We know that you know after coming out of the second first world war and the later of the second world war, the modernism movement um, was spurred because of the pandemics. And I believe that this in this moment we should try to use in a positive sense, this crisis that we're going through in order to really look for the future green strategies for our cities. And, and there's a lot of confusion happening at the moment. If you read the World Bank blogs, so some uh, quotes say that urban density is not the enemy of the virus. Sometimes you read about the corona is gonna speed up these smart and green city visions, but corona crisis and the crisis that we're gonna be facing in our century um, they lay bare things in our cities that we sometimes do not see. Otherwise, we are in a, in a radical moment like we are now. And as you see on the bottom of the screen, the, some of these large scale projects fail, like the sidewalks labs for many reasons. But um, in, this, in the end of the day, the crisis somehow was the final, um, you know, the final verdict in such projects not to succeed, unfortunately. And um, if you look into politics or policy, we, in, many of you know about this uh, images, the European Union and the international policy um, um, institutions, they look for green space and whatever they call it, whatever buzzword they use, green infrastructure for many years. But I feel now finally with the, um, also to be positive, the new European Bauhaus, uh, where I also had a pleasure to be partly engaged, uh, offers the new framework and a new political 
um, will, if you want to, to make this happen. And if you look into the challenges that the uh, GRC and the uh, European Commission um, collected during these consultation sessions with experts from all over Europe, you see that in, in the bottom, that social inclusion is an issue, inequality, disconnection from nature, lack of a high quality public space, unsustainable use of resource. So I think the most issues that we see um, also that, that are being um, revealed and being said by experts are some of them that we are trying to address today. It's about urban space and how do we really live in this sort of densified world. And here you see, I mean, we of course know the, the example from Seoul or from Vienna where um, urban transformation happens or the Prinzessin and Gärten in Berlin, just to be more concrete, that obviously green space can bring a, a value in terms of social and, and uh, ecological and environmental um, um, added value to the residents, et cetera. And, and, it, and what I try to say, and I'm closing slowly my input here is um, that we should not only look into these uh, high aesthetic and let's say expensive, if you want examples of how um, cities can become more green. And, and this project from Autogere shows it in France where um, it basically banlieues are being um, treated or the banlieues are being uh, um, case studies or use cases where uh, I feel green uh, strategies um, led to a certain social and to a certain ecological transformation of these places. And just moving on to these more radical examples, just to show that this is not just aesthetics and that we are not just uh, um, uh, putting here expansive solutions on the table, but looking to Detroit, it, it, the, the de-densified, the most de-densified uh, inner core city uh, area in the US uh, was basically revitalized through, ble through these blue and green infrastructure strategies. So in this sense, um, I believe that these strategies can become more uh, relevant also for for really treating the real world, the difficult and the big societal problems we're facing. And of course, what you mentioned for Sarajevo, we try to, to bring the green infrastructure as a spine, as a, as a most important medium to revitalize the city. And this is an ongoing 15 year long process. These projects take many years. We really believe that green and public space can become uh, the, the medium for revitalization or regeneration of the city. And I feel Cecil can add more. We met there in 2007. And just to close, we're here in Switzerland and uh, density is a uh, very highly political topic. And there are many um, serious or less serious examples that shows that how densification in Switzerland is being perceived. This is from a magazine from 1975. So looking into the future. Um, and in, if you also look into the um, everyday politics and the public participation and referendum that are very important in Switzerland, you see that urban densification is there for decades with us as the most, one of the most societally important topics. And I feel now it's the moment to really go beyond these visions, but also to make it more uh, a reality. And this is slowly happening. And there are some examples like in, in, in Zurich West where I live, where there is a certain um, dialogue happening between hard uh, hardcore real estate development and the more concerns of the um, of of this of the residents of the I would say the local people who live around there, and in this sense we do need um, stakeholder engagement, and this is where Christiane I think it's going to talk more. We need these innovative methods to um, to really bring all these people on the same table and discuss how this future green and smart and inclusive whatever you want to call a city is going to look like. And the final slide. I feel we're in a good path and just early this week, um, the Canton of Zurich uh, published its climate adaptation strategy where also um, it's, it's not the talk only about the, the trees and the distance of trees between buildings, but it's a strategy that goes into um, green roofs and uh, a, a strategy that's probably gonna bring uh, more green to at least to the Zurich Canton. And again, happy now to uh, give over the word to Alexander, and he's going to tell us more about um, what's going on in the French speaking part of Switzerland. And we also um, having Lugano here, I feel we are kind of covering the entire Switzerland somehow today. But uh, Alex is going to tell you more about uh, Geneva and also to uh, give a short introduction to Alex's uh, very broad and, 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 and rich CV. 
and uh, I, I will just list some of the elements from it. Uh, Alex Hejazi is, uh, uh, has, holds a PhD from the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA. And um, he started his career in the financing of urban infrastructures and public-private governance. And this basically was the final uh, um, document that contributed to the OECD's conference for partnership of the 21st century. And um, he is, uh, as we met also in the, uh, in the frameworks of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe uh, expert groups, he is a very strong advocate and an active expert in on the, also on the global policies on the future, uh, green and sustainable and smart city charters. And uh, here um, to, 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 to close, he brings and also this sort of global view into this academic research and his teaching on future cities in the University of Geneva. But uh, he always, and what I, uh, what I also know from his work, he includes the, you know, the impact of all these strategies into politics, geopolitics and economy. So uh, very glad to have you here, Alex, today. And the uh, uh, floor is yours. Happy to hear your contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harris. And thank you for inviting me to be, uh, to, to contributing to this discussion and conversation that uh, I hope is going to be uh, uh, as, as interactive as possible, uh, despite the great number of uh, participants. Uh, as you rightly so uh, mentioned, Harris, uh, we are in, uh, in a crossroad. Uh, there is a lot of debate and request and need for greater densification across the planet. Obviously, we are all aware of the, the failure of the suburban uh, model of urbanization uh, because of the, the economic cost, because of the environmental cost, because of the, 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 the social cost. And I will very shortly mention that and, and illustrate that. Uh, and, and nevertheless, uh, the densification is one way to go uh, we are trying to, uh, to understand, and this brings me to what you were mentioning, uh, Harris, the importance of the global uh, uh, discussion on these issues, how things are working elsewhere, and what are the best practices and worst practices. Try to learn as much as possible from each other's uh, mistakes, but also uh, achievements. And this is what is happening in Western Switzerland right now, like anywhere else. Uh, we are trying to capitalize on the knowledge basis, on the scientific knowledge as much as possible, but also on the local needs. Uh, and and uh, I would say that the, 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 the individuals and population communities uh, uh, take on, on densification and how we can move ahead with revitalizing the cities, with, with uh, revitalizing the ecosystems in the cities uh, while moving uh, towards a, you know, the kind of accepting some of the uh, uh, of obvious uh, uh, pluses of densification. And without further ado, I just want to, to share a few uh, experiences from uh, Geneva and, and uh, how things are being dealt with here. And uh, let me know if, uh, if there's a problem with the screen. Um, I wanted to, to share with you a few of the, uh, the experimentations that are happening based on the kind of a paradigm shift that is taking place across the planet, which is the understanding that the sanitary cities model of the 19th and 20th century, where we were pushing nature outside the city for obvious health and, and, uh, and uh, risk uh, associated to uh, environmental events, uh, we are moving towards an ecological city. And this transition period is long, is tedious, uh, costly, but nevertheless, very exciting because we see a plethora of experimentation, almost like in a living lab uh, environment that are shaping our cities. And uh, obviously Geneva is not the exception to the rule. One uh, kind of a shortcut that we have to the rest of the world is that Geneva is the headquarters of the European headquarters of the United Nations, as you mentioned, UNECE and other organizations produce a body of literature, a body of best practices and portfolio of best practices across the planet that we, we go and look at as scientists and try to understand what are the pluses of some of these, uh, these achievements and if they're adaptable to the local context. Contextualizing is going to be, I think, the key to, uh, to any successful uh, uh, strategy of uh, regeneration. Uh, but also uh, 
uh, bringing back nature in the city in a more meaningful way. And here I just want to share with you a few elements of uh, out of the experience of uh, Geneva, uh, explaining some of the elements of this paradigm shift that I just mentioned from sanitary to functional and ecological and regenerative cities. The goals and tools of nature-based solutions towards uh, bringing back nature so that we can address some of the uh, limitation and externalities of current models. Uh, I take example of three strategies that are being developed in Geneva, which is one, and, and obviously this is not, a, a, a mono, Geneva doesn't have the monopoly of these practices and tools. Uh, I, I know for having a student in Zurich who's working on greening rooftops and facades in Zurich, but uh, I think there is a lot to understand also in the, the synergy between scientific community, uh, the university, but engineering schools here in Geneva and the policymakers when it comes to these greening rooftops and facades uh, strategies, as well as the, uh, the second tool of the system integration. I'll be talking about the, uh, the connection of the airport, the new terminal, the uh, Geneva airport. Obviously, this goes back to pre-COVID time. Uh, the, uh, the, the new terminal of the airport is, is uh, now connected to a remote heating and cooling uh, system and network of uh, coming from the lake. Uh, and the, the third tool that I want to share with you is ecosystem revitalization, which is the, the classical watershed revitalization, but within the urban perimeters. And this, I think, will lead us to the three examples that I want to share with you that illustrate the tools. Plage de Zovi, which is a, a lake a lakeside area that was uh, uh, very much loved and used by the population, but didn't could not address the ecosystemic needs of the the area and uh, the the city of Geneva and the canton, the state of Geneva, uh, pull resources towards developing uh, that whole area. This was ba basically the first image that you saw here, which is a mix of. Uh, uh, land reclamation, but also ecosystemic revival. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's a lot to be learned from that. I go back to my previous uh, slide to say that the, the third element that, um, as I was saying, yes, these are the three illustrations. So uh, the global context, we know them all. And I really here wanted to share with you these two images of uh, uh, the region here in Geneva, one from the 50s. And uh, I don't know what happened with the with the lower one, hopefully it's hidden somewhere. Here it is. And the one which is uh, from current uh, time. And as you can see, uh, again, Geneva is not the exception to the rule. Uh, the 20th and 21st century uh, urban development uh, here also has been a tale of meeting urban growth uh, with obviously uh, a, a lot of externalities. Uh, as you can see on the images, on one side we have uh, on top top level or top image, you have uh, um, predominantly agricultural land that is transformed into some sort of uh, fragmented, I don't want to use the word suburban uh, landscape, but fragmented suburban landscape uh, at the very end of the lake. This is Geneva, but you can imagine that this, uh, even though we don't see it, that this kind of uh, landscape continues all along to Montreux, which is the other side of the lake, one hour drive for those who don't know the, the region. Um, uh, 70, 80 kilometers away. So you, you see that there is a there is an uh, ex uh, ex uh, uh, tremendous pressure on local natural and environment uh, and natural resources and environment, uh, and this has created a lot of challenges for water supply, uh, but as well as uh, uh, you know compounded effects of climate change. Uh, the fact that Switzerland is the water tower of Europe is uh, is not going to exclude us from the, uh, the, the, the water equation or the water consequences of climate change. We have too much water in this part of Switzerland, as if I can say, uh, and not enough, depending on which period of the year. In this period of the year, it's the uh, spring um, with the melting of the glaciers and snow. If you have few um, uh, unseasonal rain, uh, as you can see at the very bottom of or at the very end of the lake, we are really nicely located to get uh, the, you know, to, to be uh, affected by the, a flood risk. Uh, this also brings this, this urban growth pattern, as I was saying, creates uh, challenges for other services that cities need to provide, like sewages, uh, as well as the waste management, increasing gas house, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and 
a decreasing water and air quality, accelerate, acceleration of land and soil degradation. Uh, loss of biodiversity is an obvious element of this urban growth, as well as increasing inequalities that you don't see on the images, but it also becomes as a central element of the urban growth in association with, uh, uh, with this interface with the built in natural environment. Obviously, equity and equal access to, to natural environment uh, and nature is a quintessential part of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the obligation and responsibility of any, any city official and municipalities. Therefore, if we can reverse this, this trend and uh, bring back nature in the city in a meaningful way, we also address that social element, which is about spatial and environmental justice. And obviously, when you put that on top of the global trend that uh, we have been exposed here, our, my colleagues from University of Geneva have been working with international organizations to document uh, impacts of climate change, be it the you know, far away places like the Eastern United States with the sandy landfall that we all remember from a few, few years back. Uh, these, uh, these, all these uh, uh, planetary scale changes such as climate change and the impacts of climate change uh, do uh, bring us to a point that we do have, we do need adaptation and mitigation uh, policies and strategies for our cities. Uh, there is this understanding that the, 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 there's an urgency in the matter uh, towards sustainability transition. So can we can decarbonize our economies and cities to, um, to mitigate our impact on, on, on our environment, including on climate, but as well the, uh, to adapt to these elements. And you can see that when Sandy um, uh, landfall in, in the US, the fact that you had such a huge amount of population living on the Eastern coast of the US, all the way to the North from Florida, uh, meant, meant that the, uh, the impact and the, uh, the casualties were going to be very, very, um, uh, very high. And again, uh, this is what is happening here in Switzerland. This was three years ago uh, in, in Western Switzerland with uh, flooding. Uh, which is becoming endemic of, of our current time and cities are affected increasingly. Uh, we are moving towards a paradigm shift and maybe I'll go very fast towards these, these elements that we all know and agree on from the sanitary city to the carbon, uh, carbon city. Just wanted to, to, to emphasize that there is a common agreement uh, across the planet and uh, we all recognize the immense potential of using ecosystems uh, such as forest wetlands and peplands and urban green spaces for climate change adaptation and mitigation, uh, but also uh, the fact that these uh, the ecosystem services as a result of bringing back nature in the city can help us to move ahead with service delivery uh, more meaningfully and more um, adapted to the needs of the population while integrating and considering the elements of the uh, uh, climate change, which is the big elephant in the room. Uh, so how do we go with that? Ecological cities versus regenerative urban. So these are the two sides of the same coin. And despite the very powerful claims of both ecological cities and regenerative urbanism, uh, that, uh, uh, that they can address the needs of the population, the cities and bring back nature in the city, the pressure to regenerate cities means further development and induce ecological negative consequences. And this brings me back to what you were saying, Harris, in terms of density. The debate is on how do we deal with density and how we can um, uh, bring density while uh, making sure that the, uh, the pressure on the, uh, the natural resource pool is, is not uh, growing. Um, as I said, the limits of car-based planning are now well known from environmental, economic, and social cost accounting. Uh, but again, the regenerative urbanism can induce negative pressure on divergence, be uh, divergence between land use strategies and optimizing ecosystem service services that are, are also now very well documented scientifically. Three tools out of uh, Canton of uh, Geneva and City of Geneva uh, is uh, the first one is about greening rooftops and facades. Uh, we all know that they contribute to the well-being of the population. Uh, greenery is also an, an, an natural environment, reduces the heat island in the city and offers places to uh, rest and relax. Uh, the vegetations in the city also, it's about basis of the quality of our landscapes and forests and countryside and neighborhoods and as well as streets, so at different scales within the city. The use of indigenous species allows also distinct species of flora and fauna to find habitat, food, and reproduce. 
within the limits of the city, uh, counterintuitively, and I open a parenthesis here, and we all know about that. Uh, if I take, for example, the case of the collapsing population of the bees, uh, you see that bees, not only on my balcony, but elsewhere in the city, uh, are prospering. One of the reasons is that there has been less use of pesticides in the cities, and therefore this by itself shows that there is a chance here to bring back some of the uh, uh, the, uh, the treated species, uh, animal and vegetable species uh, outside the cities through this, um, uh, you know, uh, har harvesting them in the cities and, and, and providing them with the habitat. The case of rooftops is, is very interesting. Uh, recycled substrates have, have been used for a very long time. Innovation is to use to recycle con uh, construction waste, including biocall which are, which are all residues from our development and maintenance activities. The question is that needs to be added is what are the hydric and structural potential in this area that is uh, in the case of Geneva, which native plant species thrive on each of these substrates and how is their flowering take place as well as which insects are favored in the context. And this is the result of a study of my colleague Patrice Prunier here from the School of Engineering in Geneva that studied the, over a program of three years uh, how um, and uh, you know what? What are the answers to these questions? And uh, the same thing for the walls. Walls are everywhere in the city. Wall greening and facade greening is less widespread than the rooftop uh, and roofs. Uh, but nevertheless, experiments are moving ahead. They have great potential for improving biodiversity and quality of life, uh, as well as other positive impacts of the uh, uh, the greening the cities. Uh, the question here again, what are the uh, potential uses, uh, which species and techniques show convincing results? Uh, and then the last element is the local, uh, is the greening of the uh, quarries and brownfields that again, and on the outskirts of Geneva, we have uh, the hillside, which is a, a quarry, and uh, there has been experimentation on, on, on what kind of ecosystem can be developing around or in within the limits of the quarry so that it has, because of its scale, the greater impact on, on the city. Uh, the local context is, uh, is cannot be distinguished from the legal uh, uh, context, uh, which is uh, moving and pushing and favoring uh, these, these kind of interventions with the biodiversity law, which added to the federal law for the protection of nature and its ordinance and the cantonal regulation, uh, which is the state of Geneva regulation on the protection and of landscape and uh, natural environment and flora. Uh, and, and this also brings the two main actors in greening the city, one is the state and the other the, the city of Geneva, to work very closely together with other uh, stakeholders such as uh, uh, you know, private sector. Uh, the, the outcome of this uh, result of the, the study, as well as how it's been scaling up, please let me know how long, how much I have so that I, I shorten. Uh, Bianca, I see that three minutes. Okay, I'll go fast forward. Um, harvesting of plants in natural environment for the developing projects, use of Geneva grain mixes in agriculture and urban greening projects was the second conclusion of this study. Uh, collaboration with applied research is obvious, but nevertheless, it's uh, something that was emphasized wise again. We had hydrologists, uh, uh, experts in botanics, uh, landscapers, uh, architects, uh, urban planners, came together and worked on, on, on this project of greening of rooftops in Geneva uh, on, on the study. And uh, obviously making interventions and developing of to tools, uh, conditions in these, condi uh, uh, the, the notices, planning and construction. Seed cropping in places of interest was one of the other elements that was uh, supported by this uh, study, support for the planting and indigenous plants and trees, implementing uh, of showcase sites in Canton to communicate to the population, and ongoing studies in, in Geneva and, and Lausanne based on the uh, on, uh, on this study. The second tool that I wanted to share with you very quickly, and really I, uh, I, I want to, to emphasize that this is something that is, needs more time, uh, is system integration. This is the big lead project of uh, city and canton of Geneva with, uh, you see on the upper side of the image, the, 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 the airport here in Geneva, which is an urban airport, almost in the city. Uh, nevertheless, uh, with a need to extend uh, the expansion of the airport, re, uh, basically was was uh, uh, equated to greater emissions in CO2, uh, not only from the uh, air traffic, but also ground operation and the terminal that was being built. The city, the continent of Geneva, with other stakeholders, including the uh, 
uh, the, the electricity uh, company, uh, came up with the idea of connecting an existing project that was build, bringing the, the water of the lake for remote heating and cooling of the UN neighborhood, uh, UN quarters and the banking quarters, all the way to the airport so that the new terminal can benefit from the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the network and therefore not have the amount of uh, energy needs uh, on fossil fuel that is normally needed. And this is based on, I'm not getting into the details of the, uh, the technology, had all sorts of the, uh, the positive impacts that you can, you can imagine uh, with the, uh, within the, uh, uh, the realm of energy, but also transportation. So there was a domino effect as a result of connecting the, the airport, which uh, you know, by 2022 is not going to, to benefit from the, the, the heating and the cooling um, capacity of the water of the lake. Um, and very shortly, I want to finish up on the third tool that was uh, uh, is systematized in Geneva, which is uh, rivers and river shed revitalization. On top image is a, a channel that was a river that was concreted in the in the 30s and 40s uh, with a loss of biodiversity and ecosystemic services of a, of a river, and as a result of um, uh, new regulations and incentives, as well as, again, uh, bringing different stakeholders together in a, in a rather um, peripheral area of the city. There was a, uh, there was a plan to, um, uh, to, uh, to take stock of, of what was happened elsewhere uh, down the stream in the Rhone River. And, and this was the end result. As you can see on upper level, this is what the, the river or the canal looked like with uh, non-existing ecosystem services. And thanks to the, uh, the, the, the joint work of, uh, of three, uh, four, four different uh, expertise from different grounds, from uh, hydrologists all the way to uh, landscapers and, and architects, and as well as urban planners, uh, there was a uh, uh, kind of a re revitalized version of the river uh, on the other side, with the use of kind of biomimicking uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the, the flow of the water uh, in a normal river with these diamond shaped uh, lozenges that are going to slow down uh, the, um, the, uh, the flow of the water. And therefore, as you can see here again, there was a, a success story with not only um, the uh, you know the, the revitalized part of the river, but also creation of leisure, uh, an area of space dedicated to the leisure, to the population. Here you see picnic benches and, and areas for the population, not only to, to, uh, to look at nature being brought back to the city, but also benefit from it and make it part of their daily lives. And this is what is happening in an area which is between the agricultural land and uh, densified areas that you can not see on the other side. And this is the, the core element of my presentation. We need to bring back nature in a meaningful way in the city so that it's, it's, uh, it helps us also address the questions that the population and the needs of the population in terms of uh, livable spaces to address elements of risk and, and vulnerabilities. And I finish on that. COVID showed us that we do need these uh, risk analysis and building of resilience thanks to this to, to these uh, uh, resurgence of nature in the city uh, by creating new spaces new spaces of living together thank you very much and i uh, i look forward to expand on that later on one last image is the the, the, the lead project of Geneva, which uh, hopefully i'll have some time later on to discuss thank you very much thank you alex um, very impressive Presentation. It's very good to see these, uh, I would say, avant-garde uh, approaches that are being now tested and implemented in, in, in the Western part of Switzerland. Um, I encourage with uh, now also the audience to, to just write in the chat or ask for uh, your word, and we are happy to share the questions to, to the speakers. And I see already Clive um, was asking something. Uh, maybe, Alex, you want to briefly reflect on that, but it's an important question that you asked about um, how uh, we go beyond, if I understand correctly, the conventional urban green space, but, but increase a, uh, a need more for the co-design cool spaces, I feel, not go beyond the recreation aesthetics, but towards performative and, and multifunctional landscapes and spaces. And I feel 
the last example from Geneva, the river one is, is a good, very good example of a, of a sort of multidimensional landscape, but maybe you wanna reflect on that briefly. Well, thank you. I, obviously it's not an uh, easy task. There has been many tools that have been developed recently or being used. One is that one that I would have loved to share with you is this uh, strategic plan of uh, greening, uh, uh, Plan Stratégique de Végétalisation. And this uh, has a lot to do with uh, different stakeholders. And in this case, the state of Geneva and the city coming together as a, with, with uh, expertise from, from a professional ground uh, in, inside the departments, but also from outside to try to understand what are the elements that they and kind of uh, bring together elements that at their disposal from uh, the flow of the, from mobility patterns. So there has been mapping of at the neighborhood scale and even at the street scale of uh, the mobility patterns and the flow of uh, the movements uh, and what kind of use uh, the, the, the population make of some of the, space, the spaces, as well as a um, um, series of consultation with different uh, uh, actors with conflicting agendas. And in this case, this river uh, is, is uh, in between, uh, you know, the housing uh, areas and, you know, the residential areas and agricultural lands. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that uh, the, uh, the, the, those involved in the agricultural sector was also consulted to, uh, to see how the river revitalization and bringing, uh, you know, creating these leisure spaces can not to be detriment of the, the agricultural uh, production uh, was also a, an important element to come up with co-benefits. At the end of the day, these tools are developing and producing co-benefits. The trade-offs are, are also difficult and that's something that I, I would love to expand some other time, but that's the main question, how to deliberate on trade-offs. And the, um, the, uh, the referendums we have in Switzerland is about that. When you cannot deliberate, you give it to the population to, to decide. Fantastic. Co-benefit is the word of the day until now. So giving over to Bianca. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, Alexander. I'm always very happy if we can also exchange within our country. You know, the, there is some division because we have different languages and that makes it sometimes difficult to exchange. And um, at least you have to speak several languages to get connected. And there's always the German speaking community, the French, the Italian, the, the Italian speaking community at least goes a bit closer with the French community together. So I think they have more projects in common and I'm always very happy if we can connect and if we can exchange. So I'm happy to have also your perspective here. And I know also from, there are some people in the audience really also from the South and from the French speaking um, part of Switzerland. So I'm happy if we have also at the end of all presentations, some discussions. Now we are going to the Christians. So to the Eastern part of Switzerland. And I would like to introduce um, my colleague Sandra Bühler, we are working together at the Applied University uh, of the Grishans. And it was really for urban forestry, I was looking for a person who comes from architecture and from city planning, urban planning. And I just had a look in our own um, institution and I found Sandra. And I wrote an email if she was interested to work uh, together with me on the research or on the on the program of um, education in urban forestry and we met in real we met, met only once or twice and from that on we only worked uh, in the virtual world together but that works very well so as i mentioned sandra um is uh, studied architecture and urban development and she is uh, since 2010 um, at the Applied University and she's very much interested as she works in the um, um, in the department of Alpine regions you can imagine that there is still another topic with densification but I think you work on very interesting projects whatever you told me about them was very inspiring in the sense of how you reorganize and how you take the historical um, place into account of the planning and that's why um, both of us we um, came to our colleagues from Dresden Sommer and I'm very interested in what you want to present and I know that you have a very specific also view on densification and um, combined as well with the region of the Alps so um, 
it's the floor's yours. So I'm happy to listen to you for the next 50 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bianca, for your introduction. So um, because I'm from the country of Greece, I have to add something. Um, you forgot the fourth language. It's the Romanic. So thank you. <laughs> true, um, true. Yeah, but you don't speak that, right? It would be nice to listen to it. If someone could speak that, we, we should have it. It is a mix of Swiss German, Italian, and some words in French. It's a very interesting language. Um, of course, I forgot that. Yeah. But the play yeah. is flaws yours. Mm -hmm. So, so um, now I have to share my screen. So, you, can you see it now? Perfect. So I will say some words about the uh, land and city, cityscapes in town and villages, and a little bit um, about the specialties in the political processes. And um, I have um, especially brought some provocative thoughts with me and um, these I want to share with you. This is my first picture. The building area in Switzerland is becoming scarce. And why, we will see a little later. But in return, the needs of living spaces are getting higher and higher. Why? The increase of the population in Switzerland is by 1.2% per, per year. And the steadily increasing profitability has have, um, an impact on their construction activities. Whereas in 1970, 75% of the population lived in larger households. In uh, 2016, the figure is only 55. And there is a tendency for the demand for apartments for one or two person to increase. And at the same time, the space required per person in rapidly increasing from uh, for 34 square meters in 1918 to 45 square meter in uh, 2014. So um, this means that especially the apartments from the 30s and 70s with small rooms and narrow kitchens are no longer attractive and difficult to rent. In many places they are being replaced by residential buildings with spacious, luxurious loft-like living units with large balconies. And these buildings need more space. The effect of this demand for living space can be seen, and not only as we see here in Switzerland, in a steady expansion of the settlement area. Rings of settlement expansions are emerging, like we call in Germany Speckgürtel. The translation would be bacon belt around cities and around agglomerations. And while the, the historic city centers are relatively densely built, because the space within the city walls was very precious, today large apartment buildings are spread out in the middle and single family house areas are built. Here we see um, the density of the old city in Bern. And today, up to 50% of the settlement area in municipalities are single family house zones. And the photo shows the village of Etoy in the canton of Wood. Yes, sir. And the park, for example, which was important in the Renaissance, will be now perhaps the English garden as a place of recreation for the urban population is often no longer included in the urban development plan. And the private garden is to replace it. New large settlements are to be built on agricultural valuable land. And these building structures need even more space. Everything becomes private. 
recreation areas, squares, and meeting places to strengthen communication and coherent cohesion in the neighborhood cannot, cannot be found anymore. And the community no longer has a place. Even the neighbor's tree becomes a subject of dispute when it casts the shadow of the wrong place and in summer or leaves fall into the neighbor's garden. If a tree stands too close to the property line or protruded into the clearance of the street, there are loud voices to fix it. So even the trees have no place. But I don't tell anything new. Since in Switzerland, not only the settlement area is scarce, but also the agriculturally usable landscape, it was decided in a referendum uh, to place the development in world. And the area of the building zones must not be expanded any further. In essence, a very important and sustainable correct decision for the Swiss areas. And since 2040, this has been bindingly stated in the Spatial Planning Act. However, the space in the city is getting tighter and tighter. And this is accompanied by greater acceptations and rising emotions in a positive way or in a negative way. Today, we see the first effects of this federal legislation. The cantons adapted their development strategies, the guideline plans to these requirements. And on this basic, the municipalities were asked to create their spatial development models. One of the magic word is called building land mobilization. Backend and underused parcels are to be built on. In various existing neighborhoods, the utilization rate means the intensity of buildability is increased. And investment pressure automatically arises in central development areas as well as in historic village centers or particularly undeveloped sites within the building zones. And the more urban the area, the greater the pressure for change. The townscape or the cityscape will change considerably. But today it is an important location factor for the attractiveness of a neighborhood, of a city and a region, and especially in the Alpen regions where I live in, that are dominated by tourism. So. Another picture, for example, the original pic picturesque backdrop for one's own vaca vacation apartments with view over old farms and the mountains is the image that we want to see. It's not the apartment blocks with balconies that combines. Now here in particular, a beautiful uniform townscape with much charm from past centuries represents an important location factor. But time does not stand still in the Alpen village either. Here too, a, a population lives and works with especially the same needs as in the cities. Is the answer a real a area really building a world? Is it to build uh, family houses towering over the villages? It's of course not. A mobilization and interior development is very sensitive in smaller communi communities. The townscape is of course important and linked to expectations and perceptions. In, combi in combines the urban structure, the architecture, as well as the streets, the infrastructure, the squares, the meadows, the park and the streets in a districtive entity. In Switzerland, we have a so-called ISOS, Inventar Schützenswerte Ortsbilder. It's um, an inventory of site worthy of protection that has 
been compiled since the 1970s. This is an inventory des designated area, both built and unbuilt areas that are essential for the townscape and must be protected. Today, this inventory must be taken into account. Since 2009, this has been confirmed by various court rulings. And this called ESOS, open spaces with, within the village are so defined as worthy of protection due to their identical forming effect. Likewise, essential landscape elements at the edge of the settlement are shown to be worthy of protection. If these areas are designated as building zones in the land use planning, and this can op of often happen, they can be built on. Until now, building land in agglomerations and settlement expansions was more attractive due to easy accessibility and buildability. But now, in the meantime, these parcels have been used up and the valuable green spaces are becoming the focus of interest for investors. The major conflict arises in terms of spatial planning. If these areas are built on with modern architecture, the face of the place will change even beyond recognition, as we see here. It's, um, it was for, in form a historical form with a surrounding middle. If one would like to remove these areas from the building zone and make them available in other locations that make sense from the point of view of urban planning, we have no, uh, new problems. One example is uh, the Fruchtfolgeflächen we call, it's a crop rotation area. That is, they designate particularly valuable soils that play a central role for agriculture, or even against this ESOS, which in turn defines meadows that are characteristic for a locality. And the conflict for the future of the township and the townscape is reflected in emotional and heated discussions. What does urban density really mean? Is this equated with building on an urban open space? And who pays for the financial loss if the open space are preserved? And how much, how must these open spaces be designed so that they fulfill the interest of a common good. What is the urban quality of an open space? Is it always the same? And how can we measure this quality? And if open space are built on, how can it be ensured, ensured that quality is created with a de development? We know the importance of every tree and green space is increasing. When redesigning or converting a, a site, it is Im imperative to integrate the needs for the general public and to develop high quality new outdoor spaces accordingly. Different interests, call it, divergent needs are formulated and emotion take up a lot of space. But which interests are weighted higher? And what processes um, method and methods can be used to create a dialogue and find new ways to resolve these conflicts between landscape quality and economical interest development? Because it's certain everyone wants a comfortable flat and a beautiful living environment. And the preservation of inner city biodiversity and economic services is just as fundamental as a need as um, commun communication within the neighborhoods. So, thank you for your um, attention. Thank you, Sandra, very much. It uh, was a pleasure listening to you.
I wonder, you mentioned that at the end, um, that what what values does this, the, the space have? And I remember, because I like very much your um, point of view, we um, that are always working with green spaces and coming from that part, we always say green spaces are so important and um, it's always the pressure of bringing that in and how we can protect green spaces. But you always took when I talk to you also the other perspective of the space needed for flats, for houses, for living and so on. And I um, think there's some fruitful discussion here. And I remember a project you had where constructing constructive land was taken away from the people because to keep the historical identity. And mm -hmm. then they just gave it up, the construction land, you must imagine how that people just would say, okay, it's something um, with my land and it's constructable, but we give it to the community and um, we accept that this is a space that needs to be protected. Can you say something about this project? Because that was the most impressive I've ever heard. How would you get people to sell their um, property and to say okay we leave it like it is it must be green and there cannot be construction on it if you could say some words about that project that's really the problem of um about the financial loss everything we we do is um to we measure in financial um goods and um it's not a uh, good meaning and um the, the beautiful landscape and um uh, a person who says, oh, please do that. Uh, it's um, the financial plan behind it. And um, we said, you get another construction site on another place and you can uh, uh, can have your garden as well. And that's, um, so they had both. They had a big garden. And they had a construction site. How many people and were there that, that sold their construction site just to protect it? How many people did this? Uh, 20 families. 20 it's families. Okay. Yeah, 20 families. And um, it was not only the 20 families to, to take care of them. Uh, it was all, also the, the whole community of the village. So it came to the whole area and they had to decide democratically if they want to go that way. And when they decided, then they sold their land, so just get a new yeah. one and they had their property plus another one and you could protect the area and keep it green. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting project. I'm sure that there will be more questions at the end when we, with all this, all the presentations um, were there. Thank you very much, Sandra, for this first lens on the also um, mountain area. I think this uh, got sometimes forget, forgotten and it's not urbanized as the flatland, but still there are some problems the same as in the urbanized areas and they are still getting more urbanized as well. So I would like to introduce the next two speakers that are Christiane Gebhardt and Michael Fister. Christiane, so we come with the next presentation, we come more in the political sciences and stakeholder management questions, which I'm finding very interesting. Christiane Gebhardt um, holds a master in public administration and has a PhD in political sciences. And she has um, been specialized, or she specialized over the years on topics in urban and regional innovation, sustainability, strategy implementation on high level political concepts, which is very interesting. Also to consider political scales. And then we have Michael Fister, who um, is also interested to work on issues of sustainability, socioeconomic development and urban planning. And he was originally um, studying or he studied architecture and worked as an architect and then in urban planning and has also gained practical experiences also like Sandra. 
And then um, he made a um, second master degree at Interdisciplinary Institute of Science, Technology and Policy, ETH in Zurich, and focused also on policy analysis in urban topics. So I think this is um, a good match, the two of you together to present um, the stakeholder perspective here. And I just give the floor to you and I'm happy to listen to you for the next 15 minutes. Thank you. Let's start. Okay, well, back to reality, a really dense place I'm talking about and the dense city, it's Mannheim in Germany. And uh, I'm talking about the crucial role of public administration as a kind of setting the framing for all these changes and and uh, um, rewilding and um, also the nature-based solutions in cities um, um, well Mannheim Mannheim we, we, we saw all the idyllic places thank you for the last uh, slides I was very pleased to see that there is green nature I, I show you some more dramatic uh, things like uh, Mannheim. Mannheim has uh, three, 300,000 inhabitants. It's a very industrial industrial city. Uh, you can see here one of the slides is the coal. Um, it's the coal fired power station still here. Um, we have floods. Uh, we have rising temperature. It's 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 an area. Um, where the, the river Rhine is uh, very narrow in a way that, that the, the um, temperature can also, uh, well, <laughs> rise to 40 degrees. That's, that's not unusual these days. And um, then they have a lot of problems with, uh, they, they try to, to do the right thing. They, they planted trees. They have uh, a lot of problems with uh, fungus there, with, uh, um, with the, humidity uh, causing causing the plants to to well, either drown or then you have heat islands and uh, the trees uh, well they suffer as well and on the right hand side there there's an interesting thing that's happening right now that's the the ambrosia that's invasive species we, we find here now it, it's the plant that causes uh, um, asthma and respiratory problems and uh, on the right hand corner down here you see the new arrival of the asian tiger mosquito bringing us dengue fever so it, it's more of a nature strikes back uh, um, thing here um, and we we need to we need to uh, well take care of these challenges and, and on the other hand side uh, the political concept the high level concept is um, um, CO2, CO2 reduction CO2 impact measurements uh, compensations and uh, implementing the, the climate policy well the profile we, we did a project here it's funded that's lovely in germany we have these big big flagship programs in order to to in, initiate change and the total budget was here 1.3 million euros it's a research project in governance and finding out how can we design the transformation path to, to well to um, um well harmonize nature-based solutions and the social social change in cities um uh, it's it's a consortium that does it it's a triple helix consortium it's you have universities industries government city administration as um players that are that they're responsible for the implementation of the of the strategy it's commissioned by the german federal government uh, the funding agency is the ministry of education and research so now i need Uh, you have to unmute. It's magic what you do there. <laughs> that was really, yeah. Um, 
so it's it's about the, the program is called climate resilience um, uh, resilient cities it's a problem driven approach um they it, i just showed you the pictures it's 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 about heat islands it's it's weather events like floods and um you also want to bring in innovation um you test urban gist data to monitor the changes to to see where impact is possible um and and um also assess what you're doing um you'll bring in also new methods like integration for stakeholder integration that's what you just um, mentioned um sandra that you have to ask people and you need the ex acceptance for change it's a big transformation and change program really um yeah you need to meet climate targets that's the main thing and uh what are you willing to sacrifice here what what uh, what are the right things to do and when that's the that's really on the agenda and you need to find out well what's the best path best path in a kind of not too disruptive but more evolutionary um, um, way the concepts employed is um are the climate resilience is a, is, a, is a shiny term you know but it, it involves climate protection and it's a very short-term thing you see the problems you see the fl floods you see the mosquitoes and you can take action now and the citizens will appreciate that you're taking actions and you have this climate ad adaptation <clears throat> and that's a bit tricky because uh, it's a kind of science-based ecocentric approach and not not everybody in the city understands that you have to give up your house because there is um, it's blockage to um, to fresh air um, or that you need more trees in the city rather than social housing so there are a lot of conflicts involved here and you need to take decisions and you need to take the stakeholders and um, participate them um, so we started we started because um the the um government is not fit doing this they, they're not thinking in this adaptive participative governance terms so we took different departments different political level experts uh or a lot of ngos and well it, it was an all-in approach so to speak in order to find the best solution um citizen engagement but it's it's rather common in in switzerland it's not so common in, in germany it's a big change paradigm change and also district level something that's not a legal concept district uh, district is something that well you notice when you leave a district and come to another so the streets might change the people might change but it's not a legal thing like areal or quartier it's not there so they uh, thought about it because it's a it's a good level where you can change things and participate uh, let, let the uh, citizens or the people living there participate um yeah it's also a protection of vulnerable groups um well we all know that suffering uh, and, and poverty and um age um is is, is somehow related so if you think about heat islands who will suffer elder people um, um not not uh, not so rich people they have still have to take the bus and so on so it, it's also about uh, protection of these groups and the, the the big challenge was how to be adaptive yeah how to make changes how to have a process that can be revised uh, how to how to work with um, the, the political administration that comes from uh, um, Max Weber and the last century, and they have a lot of uh, silos. They have a well strong hierarchy, so it's really about changing um, the administrative system of the city and bringing all uh, the the, um, the the relevant experts together in the city for a joint action. Um, uh, that's your computer. Um, mm -hmm. It's not working. 
Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not going through this, but you know, it was all planned, of course. It, it's building a virtual organization with this kind of money you, you can imagine you, you need to well provide a plan you need to to think it over when to do what um, so we did a lot of things we used real labs we we uh, we had we had to learn how administration works in two cities uh, like like Mannheim and Halle we had a different a twin city in order to compare the results um, we we uh, did two integrations. Integration means this kind of stakeholder integration, and we have a sounding board of uh, insurance and and fire brigades uh, um, representatives in order to give some inputs into the project. Uh, on the top of it, you see the consortia. So it's funded by the Bundesministerium für Bildung und Forschung. Uh, it's the city of Mannheim as a use case. It's the other city, the twin city is Halle at the Saale. You see another river, floods, heat islands, same problems, different city in the east. Um, then we have um, the Hafen City University Hamburg on board. Uh, you know that they partnered with the MIT and city dashboards and so on. So they bring in their expertise and then uh, the main, the, in, in the lead is the University of Stuttgart. They they are organizing the whole process, and Dresden Sommer, of course, does the um, GIS uh, data and the, and the technical sides, how to measure and monitor change, how to plan it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really the dramatic situation on the on the that's the the. Um, urban climate analysis um, and you see on the on the left hand side uh, where the, the dark red is that's the city center that's the city center and it's not getting any cooling effects from from the other uh, from the other um, built environment it's really all blocked and people are considering well <laughs> to tear um, buildings down and, and to build differently, to plant trees in order to get fresh air into the city and cooler air. Yeah, it's about heat islands, I told you this. So what they did is in order to show how can it um, addressed, um, they, they're taking one of the um, uh, old sites, Spinelli barracks, you know, the Americans, they had a lot of military bases in Germany, they, they all left. And, um, this area links two cities. It's um, uh, uh, the city of Freudenheim and, and Mannheim. And on the left-hand side, you see the plan. Um, you, you see the little arrows. Well, if, if you change this in a way that you don't block it with buildings uh, and you build in, in a certain way and you, and you have nature-based solutions, it will have a positive effect on the inner city. And you see the inner city, it's a grid. Uh, I, know, I don't know whether you all have been to Mannheim. They have this grid structure. It's very dense, it's very narrow. Um, and well, that's their idea of, uh, of getting cooler air into the city and um, and uh, deal with the challenge of heat islands. Yeah, that's um, that's Smartillions, Morgenstadt. You find more on the website. Um, that's an interesting project, and it's a project well how to, to to do it and learn at the same time. So it's it's a new approach, uh, governance approach, and it's really based on um, what the administration can do because they will stay they're just here for us for the citizens and they, they take the responsibility um, to um, to manage the city in a way that we can live in the city yeah mm -hmm. that's Mannheim and now back to Switzerland and mm -hmm. my turn thank you very much um, I'm happy to just briefly go to the second um, part of our presentation, which is a very similar topic, but um, I'm going 
to go a bit more into detail, it's about the city of Lucerne. And you can see, um, what you can see here is Lucerne Nord, which is an area, um, a formerly industrial area at the periphery of the city of Lucerne. And as you know, <coughs> all of the bigger cities in Switzerland and worldwide as well, um, population growth is um, one of the biggest challenges that they actually have. And on top of that, there is also the, the official imperative to densify the cities and not to build more urban sprawl, as we heard before as well. And this is why this uh, post-industrial area here is currently being transformed into a new district with um, housing, there's a university, um, there will be commerce, etc. And you can already see that it is a um, very complex environment. There are different uh, building typologies. There are two rivers coming together. Um, there is really heavy infrastructure. And there are many existing and new stakeholders that are coming together here. And this site in our eyes can only be transformed into a new and sustainable district. Um, with a good quality of life for everyone if these stakeholders can uh, be integrated and if their wishes can be uh, considered early on. And here you can see a plan of this district. You can see the scale is quite significant. Um, yeah, 3,300 new inhabitants are expected, for instance. And um, to, to integrate all these new and the previously existing stakeholders as well. Um, the canton of Luzern created this new entity, uh, which is called Smart City Luzern Nord. And this entity, they created this charter, Smart City Charter for this, this district. And um, such a charter, of course, it's, um, it's a great start, but the question is how do you implement it in the real world? And this is where our team from the integrated urban solutions team um, came into play. We were um, looking at these two pillars, people and living. And our role was really to, um, to listen to these stakeholders and to understand them, what are their desires and what are their needs and uh, what are their fears as well. Um, this also plays into our own expertise, which is to integrate stakeholders and combine it with urban and spatial plans. Um, just briefly, I will go through the process, our methodology that we used. Uh, first of all, we wanted to, of course, understand this site and we went on a site visit and then we conducted a first uh, online survey um, among the stakeholders. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more on that later. And then we conducted an urban lab uh, workshop. And in the workshop, we first of all ourselves presented a few best practice examples. And then the participants um, were put into four different groups. And in the groups, they elaborated and co-created um, new proposal uh, proposals for project ideas. And in the end, from our side, we took these proposals and um, I have to say, I forgot these proposals. They were, um, there were a lot of proposals and we had an elaborate democratic process um, as usual in Switzerland to, well, to select a number of top proposals. And these top proposals were synthesized by us into a district uh, transformation plan. I'm going to show it. To you later as well. Um, so I'm going to go again through the process. Here you can see some images of the site. Already today it's it's a very dynamic uh, and diverse um, environment. And beginning with the online survey, here you can see the participants. Um, for instance, they included just private citizens, some planners, um, government representatives, uh, local enterprises as well. And they all um, were asked to, to formulate um, some strengths, weaknesses, and 
first project ideas for um, their vision for the Southern Nord. And you can see they were very um, happy to formulate these ideas. And um, what you can see here is only a small excerpt of these inputs. And um, well, we had so, uh, so many inputs, we decided to cluster them into four different thematic fields and just the fields that covered um, all these inputs. Uh, they were local identity, everyday mobility, uh, neighborhood amenities, and quality of life. And we also categorized them into more general principles and uh, concrete project ideas. And um, what I showed you before, um, here these um, breakout groups that I mentioned were actually um, divided um, according to these four thematic fields. And just to show you some examples from the inputs that the participants gave from the field of local identity, um, these were the general principles, for instance, create a community, and some more examples for the same thematic field, but project ideas. They were really interesting proposals. Um, this is only in the first phase in the online survey. Um, going on, we then plan to make to conduct a real world workshop, but obviously um, we had to uh, conduct it online and we used this mural platform, which is an online platform with digital kind of sticky notes and the possibility to take online um, online quick online surveys, which was a um, very good experience as well. Here's some impressions from this workshop. Um, I think you're familiar with this kind of experience by now as well. Um, here is just an impression of one of these breakout um, groups. Um, each person um, formulated some ideas here. You can see it here in the table. And the same information is here in this screenshot from the mural. Um, each line, oh, I'm sorry, each line represents one idea um, and the implementation strategy and necessary collaborators and the red dots represent the votes that each idea received from other um, participants. And yeah, coming to the end, um, we then, uh, in the end, these were the top six um, project ideas that came out of this entire process. And we took them and also applied them on the spatial level of the CERN node, which you can see in the middle, which is kind of the overall project plan. And, um, and as an overall result, it became very clear that all the participants actually obviously wanted to increase the quality of life, but uh, by having a strong connection to nature, and you can see that um, actually, all of these top proposals are directly or maybe indirectly connected to, to green space um, or the outdoors more generally, maybe also um, the outdoors um, in terms of safety and an aesthetic value of, of the outdoors in general. And it, this results also shows that um, the smartness, the mobility, sustainability and the social spheres it's all connected um, in a way in the green space within cities. And perhaps, um, yeah, the real smartness in such a development can be achieved if this connection um, can be established. So, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Michael and uh, Christiane for the presentation. First quick question, how many proposals did you get for Luzerne? Because you said it were a lot. I'm sorry, I just didn't. Yeah, uh, sorry, I wanted to know how many proposals did you get because you just mentioned it were a lot. Yeah, we had um, we had thirty six uh, participants, and I don't know how many proposal proposals um, in total there were, but each participant, I don't know, maybe in average, each participant formulated maybe five to ten ideas. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just to have a uh, an image of uh, what you dealt with. Yeah. Um, there are 
discussions starting in the chat and I want to pick up the one from Clive. He, you heard the questions he um, um, asked to Alexander and he went on and I think um, it's interesting, Clive, question, you can also switch on your camera and ask directly because your um, question touches also the political system and asking that there's different qualities of um, of greening and, and green spaces and um, how you would get the space. And I think Switzerland is maybe a bit different with the direct democracy. So we have maybe other rhythms of decision-making, but um, your question was not absolutely answered, I think. And it would be a good start for the overall discussion. If you want, Clive, you can just um, step in. Um, I hope my microphone is working, but I don't think it is. Oh, no, I can't stop start my video. Oh, I can't. But we hear you. We can see you, but we hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's been an excellent session, first of all. Um, very interesting. Um, yes, I, I, I wanted to go a little further. Um, we talked about co-design um, and uh, Another terminology that is, is, is increasingly being used is around co-governance. Um, to an extent, I, I find and I've observed through my own work that um, there's been significant progress in terms of um, organizations working together, professional organizations like consultants, design studios, working with local government, um, often working with industry and indeed to some degree with communities as well. I think we are moving forward. But what has also been observed in some cities, I mentioned some of them in my question, is where citizens have become so frustrated with the apparent lethargy and slowness of the system that they've tried to sort of become the direct agents of change themselves. And this presents a number of problems um, to those who feel that they have professional rights, skills that they've developed over many years, and particularly for local politicians who through in a democratic system feel they have a right to govern. Um, I've come across instances now all over the place. Um, I mean, perhaps it started with items like guerrilla gardening, but increasingly, there are areas which are being literally taken over by local communities, um, often peripheral land on housing states, industrial estates. Um, there are active groups, one city I know quite well here in the United Kingdom is the city of Bristol, where there is now a whole movement of people who are going out taking ownership in an inverted sense of green space and co-designing it themselves often independently of the professions and of the city using crowdfunding for instance to achieve money sweat equity investing their own time and effort and i just really wanted to pose that as a question perhaps it doesn't yet happen in switzerland but it's certainly happening elsewhere in europe and I think I would be really interested to hear what yourselves as urban professionals feel about that. Is that something we should celebrate or something we should try to incorporate in our work? Um, mm -hmm. And so really it's a bit of an open question for inviting the speakers to reflect on that point. I think it's a good start for Michelle and Christiana because they have been working on different scales as well. So you might respond also, Christiana, maybe from the German perspective compared to the Swiss perspective. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead. Yeah, okay, well. Yeah, Clive, thank you very much for the question. I, I love Bristol. I spent a year in Bristol. Uh, <laughs> so, good place. Uh, I, yeah, it's it's a, a double-sided double sword yeah it's it's it's, it's, it's lovely, lovely that that citizens take, take responsibility it. and they want to change things and they they take their own money and invest and do but um there's, there's a there's a failure of governance there, there's a failure of the administration and that that's something that that needs to be addressed too uh, and and we can't have those parallel worlds of the legal and engineering 
uh, path and, and then the citizen driven path. I think we, we need to find some integration here. It's, 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 I, I see it like you, it's, it's an excellent question. It's, it's positive, but, 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 but you, it's, it's, it's happening because you have a state failure. Yes. And, and then that, that's, that has to be addressed too, my opinion. Yeah. Um, th this question for Michael, I just yeah. <laughs> saw it in the chat room. Is it answered? I mean, no, I, 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 yeah, I, I can't hear him. I can't hear him. Um, I don't no. have mute, so let me let me speak because you're using two side by side computers. I think you've got mm. around an echo. Exactly. Once the mute, Danny needs to mute when Mike Michael is speaking, so that is the solution. Yeah, Michael, you go ahead. Question, Christiana, whether I, you'd answer the question, and it's true, I think it does reflect the failure of, of governance, or at least that's one perspective on it. One might also say, well, actually, it's a success of governance. Um, you know, there are, and this is something that's come about, I think, through a shift towards the conventional left right politics towards a green politics. Um, and also, I think it also reflects the fact that you could say, well, maybe a new form of governance is actually citizen action. And that, you, you know, we shouldn't necessarily, we can see it as a challenge to old models but we could celebrate it as the creation of a new model. Um, I only pose that as a question because like you, I think I probably have mixed feelings about it, but observationally it is happening and it's happening, I think on an increasing scale, at least in some places. And that raises an interesting research question is why does it happen in places like Bristol? and London and Berlin. <laughs> Why is it not happening in perhaps Swiss cities or in Turin or, or whatever? And I, I think we just need to ride the journey and see where it takes us. That would be, be my, my thought on this, really. Michael. Maybe just a small additional um, thought. Um, of course, I think that the discourse on um, uh, you know the retraction of government or more planning of government is um, is an ongoing discussion for a long time in in urban planning but um i think in switzerland there has also been um there has been such uh, initiatives um i mean i know of some initiatives in geneva for example um by a housing cooperative who um who when they built a new um a new district they really um planned an urban gardening uh, concept into their um, yeah into their project and I think um, such projects if they're a bit bigger this requires also quite a lot of um, of organization of um, just botanical knowledge and um, also maintenance of this place and um, you need some kind of um, also social organization behind such projects and and yeah, I think I think this can happen, and it happens. But um, I think maybe one of the pre preconditions for this is um, uh, is the availability of such groups that that are well organized and and have available uh, knowledge for that. Yeah. There's an interesting point. I lately talked uh, a few days ago uh, with a person. Um, there's a huge area, I cannot mention too much detail, is in a Swiss city, a huge area that that is constructive land, but still green and used differently. But now the city decided to build on that. They do not even have the investors and the constructor, but they decided now is the time to construct on that area. And that comes in front of the population, that a popu uh, the public will this be able to decide if they want it or not but she told me that they probably will accept this because they somehow are afraid of um if i if i say no here they will build in front of my house there's a kind of egoism in there so if if this space is constructed on i may be the one they will skip and this is 
even if the population decides, it must not mean that they design, decide for green spaces. And that is also an interesting thing. But I think there's another dynamic concerning the guerrilla question. I think as the pu public can uh, bringing themselves into those discussions, maybe Switzerland has a bit of another dynamic, mm. but um, it's just uh, well, one part. Well, what they call it, well, in Bristol, perhaps they uh, just get on with it in Switzerland, I think you'd have a referendum. But I, yeah. I see that uh, Alexander has had his hand up for some yes. Yeah, of course, of course. Just, Alex. And, and Harris is also having um, some interesting thoughts on that. Alexander. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. This was a ex great uh, discussion that we are having. Uh, I may, if you may allow me, I, I want to share an experience again from Geneva uh, and building up on what Clive was saying. Uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the first lockdown, uh, the city council and the state of Geneva, that where there is a coalition between uh, the Green Party and the Socialist Party, uh, under the uh, the sort of uh, with the inspiration of expanding soft mobility, with that long long term vision, uh, almost overnight, uh, started to uh, to widen the uh, the bicycle paths within the city, and mostly, uh, and this was very visible on the uh, the very strategic artery that are the um, the, the streets on the lakeside or the case. And did this did backlash? So it wasn't citizens against the state. It was the state supporting uh, a certain vision of the population, which was pro soft mobility and, and so on. And it did backlash with uh, with you know the the, the the rest of the population, or at least those who are pro growth uh, car owners uh, and you know being stuck in the traffic and so on. And and the lack of consultation here was. Uh, did, did backlash, but the other say it wrong. What I want to say is that it's not a white or a black uh, sort of perspective where you have citizens fighting. Obviously, we all know with uh, trends such as, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, I forgot the name of the, uh, the, the critical mass, uh, the, the, the bikers that go to, to the streets and in, in great numbers and occupy the street. You have a, a, a greater visibility. The question is how this is going to be effective on long term. How effective this is going to be a build up towards a solution that can be durable. Um, and this is something that is uh, is going to be the the reality of our cities in years to come. It will complexify the this negotiation, the discussions between citizens and and the uh, the state and the cities. And um, so that that's what my my experience of Geneva is that it's not. See, only citizens take you know going towards this uh, uh, guerrilla um, kind of um, um, strategies or tactical urbanism. It's all it's a it's a mix. It's getting complicated now. Sure. No, that's uh, I feel that's what you what you're saying, Alex, is directly relating to to the point that Tatiana from Lugano brought, and um, and it's about exclusion. It's about the risk of uh, having the non-digital natives or, or people who do not have a high speed internet access or, or interest to participate in this digital mode uh, excluded. And um, if I also may uh, uh, share some thoughts about that and related to our Lausanne project, um, we were forced to, to move into the digital realm. So all these uh, funky, uh, diverse uh, workshops, th those are from our previous projects. And this, so we did entirely digital, except of, of course, the site visit and the conversation with a very interesting client here. So there's a new entity that was being formed to steer the development of Lutzen Nord uh, called Lutzen Plus. And, and this is where we, um, we were very careful not to exclude the, the, let's say the parts of the population that sometimes that you realize they do not participate often. Um, Emmen or Emmenbrücke, so this is the, uh, the, the peripheral I feel the uh, suburban part of, of, of Lucerne that, that is exactly at the border of our site. It has one of the highest um, migrant or uh, populations in Switzerland. And we felt also looking at the first, uh, um, first version of the participants list that some of these people were probably excluded. So we made sure that we have, obviously the, there's, they're formalized in Switzerland, the participatory um, neighborhood groups, 
and then local startups, the university already mentioned by Michel, et cetera. So we have a really diverse uh, uh, field. And also to add a point here um, on, on Berlin and Detroit, maybe I jumped to, too quick in my introduction is, um, you know, those are the usual suspect cities, the ones with that struggle with economic problems, Berlin in the 90s, Ber um, Detroit in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. But the interesting thing was that these um, inclusive and green and blue strategies um, were basically amplifying um, these small scale guerrilla actions and then upscaling them. Again, not to, 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 to advocate it, there were many issues on the, on the way, but that's actually what we tried to do in the CERN, just to amplify what is already there. And this final map you, you saw is a synthesis of these 36 people having five ideas. So many, many ideas and the synthesis and spatialization of these um, of these issues there that's what you saw but um, again here we, we have also the the fourth part of Switzerland uh, uh, with, with Lugano represented here and I would like also to to ask Tatiana also to share some uh, um, thoughts and share some uh, insight what you are doing in Lugano with this Lugano Sostenibile uh, and is, is there is a project that's what I figured out is also financed and supported by the federal agency of spatial planning so i um, very glad to hear what's uh, what's happening in lugano in terms of sustainable development so tatiana if you are so kind to share with us so thank you very much for inviting me to this really interesting uh, talk um, i come from academia as well so i did my phd and postdoc in urban economics so i did urban urban uh, modeling uh, in the field of uh, behavior modeling of uh, urban actors, so the citizens, the uh, companies, etc. Uh, it was more of a residential location choices that I modeled, but this was integrated into like uh, models of uh, uh, in informatical models of, uh, of of urban realities, and. Uh, uh, after my uh, doing my PhD and postdoc, I had a chance to come to the city of Lugano uh, to work for the city. Uh, it's, uh, it's about one year and a half that I worked there. And basically what I have seen that the biggest problem is the, in the administration, how to implement the strategies that we planners or urban economists are having um is that the administration this 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 part of you know we 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 mm -hmm. do not uh know how to call uh, how to discuss between each other we don't use the same languages so um for example what i saw in administration is that uh, administration often sees very interesting projects and they start to work on these projects uh, without having a global strategy on where they want to end up so uh, what I did uh, with this uh, project of mine, uh, which I'm a developer and project manager, it's Lugano Sostenibile, so Sustainable Lugano, is to build an overall strategy of the city of how to implement uh, the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations on the city scale. So this includes uh, the, the urban planning, but it includes all other uh, areas of urban development. So for example, uh, the energy issues, the mobility, the social side, the economics, etc. So basically um, this project was built uh, in order to approach three major actors. Uh, the first one is uh, civil society and citizenship. And we wanted to uh, promote this idea and to make the citizenship know about Agenda uh, 2030 of the United Nations and to participate in this, in this uh, movement, how, how I can say, towards sustainability. The second partners are the network of economics, universities, and research and development and innovation. Uh, so we implement all the technologies uh, that are going to push up the green economy here at the local level. And on the third side, uh, we are sensibilizing and explaining to administration how to implement this strategy in the city. 
So uh, on, on, based on all the levels of, uh, of uh, so all the 17 objectives of the, of the United Nations SDG goals. So we have a very big project here going on and it includes uh, like really everything. Uh, I've worked in, uh, in the field of uh, urban economics, of planning, of architecture, informatics, as well as mobility. So um, that's why I have a global like view, and I had the, also the, the the chance to know very well the uh, the urban reality of Lugano, because we need to start from a status quo. We need to know our reality where we work. So maybe some professionals or some universities they don't know, they don't have the knowledge of the issues of the city. So this is another really really big problem that we come into a reality, we want to implement something that is not very good for the, or adequate, adequate solution for the, 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 the city we are working on. So uh, what ha I had uh, the chance to do is that in my work, I've, uh, I have been uh, studying different cities over the globe, but uh, most of my studies were on city of Lugano. So where, I, I worked on, so I know very good the city and I know which problems it has, also the tendencies for the future. Uh, for example, we have a, a aging population. In next 20 years, we will have more than 50% of our, our population that will be in pension age. So this is like a really, really big issue for us to address. And also we have a mobility issue that uh, it, the congestion and uh, the traffic and pollution in Lugano is very high. So we need to address uh, that as well. So based on these points, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going with the strategy and, uh, and developing with all departments of the city, uh, specific programs. <laughs> No, that's, uh, I, I feel, you know, that this is exactly it. It, it needs a, almost like a person who synthesizes all these policy goals, the, who has the local knowledge and, and who, who can sort of be, you know, bridging between academia and practice and et cetera. So what Christiane also mentioned, it needs entirely new consortia and new kind of governance model. So this is, this is the only way to, to change. But um, I, I will be advancing with time. I cannot uh, help myself, but also to bring in this the question that uh, Cecil and Alan discussed together with Sandra in the chat. And it's about another topic that somehow comes, I would say, from this sort of crisis context about uh, small uh, living units. And I remember the, the, the economic crisis in the late 80s and early 90s, where uh, the boom of these kind of micro houses emerged in Japan, for example. Um, but this is uh, something that directly relates to what Sandra mentioned, is, is that we uh, have to densify and we have to transform and be resilient, etc. But our kind of um, average square meter per person is, is growing. And uh, maybe as an architect, Sandra, the question to you is, uh, how can we really uh, marry these two? How can we marry and how can we bridge this paradox of having living and, and architectural quality while also not uh, having our apartments grow and grow in terms of square meters. The tendency is that we um, that the, the the use of land is growing and um, the flats are going bigger and bigger. But perhaps in Zurich we have uh, another tendency. It's um, it's a um, stagnifying. Mm. tendency at the moment so maybe there will be another um yeah it's now time to to re rethink about what what we live in and how we want to to live and um i think it's not even the um the space we live in it's um also the quality we live in and it's um, the quality inside the house and it's the quality outside the house. And sometimes we can um, um, rebuild uh, an area and uh, ha have higher qualities with a new uh, sort of structure than with the old side of structure. We have to decide where we have high qualities inside the houses and outside the houses and where we can um, rebuild 
um, and renew the structure in other places. Oh, no, very, very interesting. Um, I don't know, Bianca, maybe I give the word over to you, but uh, I, I feel it's also having the, the federal uh, uh, government here represented with Clemos, maybe it's, it's good to, to hear also a bit of, of how the kind of higher political and policy levels deal with these topics. Uh, here, there is Clemos already. Hi, Clemos. <laughs> Do you want to add anything to the discussion? So there's a whole Swissness here yeah. <laughs> from all parts. Yes, uh, thank you for, for the words, uh, Harris. Actually, I, I, am, I really liked the discussion. I think it was very interesting to bring that people together that they can exchange ex actually internationally and so on. What I can tell here is that the, the urban forestry area is, is growing. It's a, it's a thematic that is growing in Switzerland also. It will be, it's directly not, not right now in the, in, the, in the Swiss law for federal act on forest but it will grow for the protection of biodiversity, for example, this issue will come and will grow in, in, our, in our office in the, in the biodiversity division. And we are having some project on, on this issue the, to, to green the, the, the infrastructure in the cities and so on. And I think this is a very important discussion that we are having now in, in order to really to put into practice what the research, the research bring us and really to try to, to go in, in the right direction for for the new cities in, in the future. So thank you very much to have organized that. It's a very beautiful discussion. Yeah, thank you very much to all of you. It is really interesting to have all the perspectives together. And um, one, one um, little thing regarding a guerrilla um, work. So I lately heard that uh, guerrilla activities are going very far. I have heard about some people that are having hamsters and selling the hamsters and whenever you i mean if there's a construction site that should not be constructed on he sells hamsters and you have them it's in germany because then um the the whole uh, process will be blocked for over 10 years because this hamster is protected and the guerrilla activities go very far i just wanted to mention that it's not only the people but they are also doing commerce out of it so they kind of sell the ideas of of going against rules and that shows just how extreme that goes and what i also take out of the discussion is really the um that it densification is not always the same there are different types of densification what we have in switzerland is also the whole discussion of building underground and how far can you go into the ground how far can you go up and um, that has also very much effects on trees and uh, lately here in Basel we had um, like um, there were like paintings on the ground saying here will be a huge container underground and I think the whole population here started to fight against it and I'm sure that it, oh, it looks like it will not come so there are so many things that are going on so many questions and also what i find very much interesting is not only to talk about densification is not good there comes the question of how do we want to live again and again this question comes all of the time but also it's it's always the same we don't want to harm nature but we fly everywhere we we, we want to have green spaces, but we do want to have also huge apartments and space for ourselves. So the question how we can also change some mentalities is um, yeah. quite interesting. And um, before I finalize, Clive, you're raising the hand. Time is up, but I would allow you the last comment and um, before we close this session. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you, Bianca. I, I want, uh, wanted on behalf of VFUF, as some of you, but not all of you, will be aware I'm, I'm presently acting as the convener of the steering group for EFOF. I really did, since this is a Swiss event, I really wanted to um, use this opportunity to thank the Swiss for everything they've done this year for EFOF. Bianca in particular has, has made massive effort, um, has you. led a digital transformation in the uh, um, difficult situation caused by COVID. Um, we had to cancel our normal EFUF plans, although we hope to meet again next May in 2022. 
Um, a big thing, thank you also to Clemence and her ministry for providing some uh, finance that has made that happen as well. Um, and Switzerland is certainly living up to its reputation as an international player. Uh, so thank you, Clemence. And although um, IFOF is now really drawing to a close, Bianca will probably confirm that this is likely to be the last event yeah. of, of IFOF 2021. Uh, the digital platform allows our work to continue. And I would like to invite you all to an event on the 11th of June, which we're organizing. It's going to be called a Tree Awakening. Uh, it will be promoted through the EFUF website and through the, um, the new app that uh, Bianca and colleagues have delivered. Um, what's really exciting about that event on the 11th of June is that Cecil will be re revealing to all his latest thinking, um, which we, um, you know, Cecil is, is a, a leading light in the urban forestry world without any doubt. And um, uh, I think he is one of the speakers and we also have panelists representing the city of Ljubljana in Slovenia, uh, city of Barcelona and also fr from uh, Brussels, the uh, Brussels capital region. So I think it promises to be a really excellent event too. Thank you all. And thank you especially to you, Bianca, for organizing this. Uh, I think thank we're you very much. greatly indebted. Thank <laughs> you. Round of applause for Bianca. <laughs> it's very nice. Yeah, it's you're oh, also way, far it's away. Also, I'm. I know. It's also my birthday, so I. I, I like know, it. Clay. <laughs> yes, it's your birthday. I'm. I am. Um, I wish you all the best for your birthday, and um, I'm very happy that you all gave us the chance here to to do this together. And it's the final event because we had to um, cancel the live events. There was a um, excursion tomorrow planned, but we had to cancel due to the situation. But still we have the My EFUF app all, because there were also some questions um, if that session was recorded. So all very main um, events are to be found in the app. So even if you missed an event, you can just have a look in the app what we also have is poster sessions. So there are so many posters sent right now. So which is very nice to look at all the posters and projects and you could still contribute to it. But over the time, people now get used to the app and, and dive more into the digital world. And with the app, you can also go outside. This was always my intention that you do not have to sit here in front of the computer. So I'm very happy that we have so many exchange that we have this in the app we have also the urban forestry podcast we have events going on and i'm happy that i um, could um, give my inspiration and all my thoughts into this uh, network and that you we, you were open um, that to, to these new formats and i'm happy that we could do at least something and um, i'm happy to see you all maybe in belgrade next year i hope that will continue but I'm happy if you want to contribute, if you want to be a guest in the podcast, whatever. So just write us an email. And I'm happy that we got more connected even on another level, even if we could not meet. And thank you very much. And yeah, I'm happy that we came together here for the discussion. Thank you. And I leave you there. And um, yeah, just... Um, Ciao, Ciao, Ceci. <laughs> for, for um, yeah, being here and exchanging. I know we could discuss longer and longer and um, for sure we will. So enjoy your birthday, Clive. <laughs> and um, enjoy uh, the time. And I'm very happy to be part of the EFUF network. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bianca. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. See you soon.